All right, everyone, welcome to Discovery Live, Ask an Expert. Uh, my name is Ben Gondras, and I'm the Dome Theater Manager at the Fort Collins Museum of Discovery. And it's my pleasure to, once again, uh, welcome you to Discovery Live. And uh, I just want to let you know, the way that this program works is that we curate some experts. Uh, sometimes they're scientists or musicians. Tonight, we have um, some financial experts that are going to join us on the program. And hopefully you guys will have questions for these experts. So if you do have questions for them, be sure to leave those questions down in the comments below. And I will ask the questions of our experts and hopefully we'll get some really amazing answers. Um, and before we get started, I did just want to uh, thank Elevations Credit Union for supporting tonight's episode of Discovery Live. Um, they're one of the museum's great partners in our community and help us to fulfill our mission in the community. So we just wanna thank them for their support of this program. And with that said, we actually have our first two experts who I'm going to welcome on right now from Elevations Credit Union. Welcome Nadine uh, and Chris. Hi Ben, thank you. Hi Ben, thanks for having us. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, why don't we start out uh, by just introducing each of you, and if you want to tell us a little bit about yourselves, um, who you are, what you do at Elevations Credit Union, and maybe a little bit of your background. Um, and Nadine, you're just to my left, so why don't you go ahead and uh, start us off? Thank you, Ben. My name is Nadine Trujillo Rogers, and I'm a business banking relationship manager with Elevations Credit Union. This year is my 27th year in banking. My role at Elevations is to take care of our small business members. So I am the go-to person for any business question, business account, or business loan. Um, my background is, is that I am a, a Northern Colorado native. So I was born and raised in this area. Um, again, I've been in banking for a really long time. I've done just about every position at the bank <laughs> from a uh, teller to most of my career has been in management and business. Um, and so I'm, I'm here to answer any questions. And again, thank you, Ben, and the Fort Collins Museum of Discovery for having me. Excellent, thank you so much, Nadine. And uh, Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, my name is Chris Thorpe. I'm a financial advisor with Elevations Credit Union, and uh, I've been in banking myself for what seems like forever. And and into my banking career, I realized that I really, really like the um, stock market and wealth planning and and uh, retirement planning, and and got and got into the. Uh, all my licenses together and got moved into this role and I really love it. It's it's a great way for me to feel like I, I help people every day, not just make the decisions on what stocks to buy, but uh, um, just overall making their lives better, making them plan and making them feel like they can sleep at night. Um, love what I do, love, love the Fort Collins area. I've raised my kids uh, here for the last 20 plus years and um, just, just love being here, and uh, we're, we're excited for our partnership with you. And happy to be on with you tonight. And hopefully, you've got some real good questions for us. Yeah, I agree. Um, hopefully, we get some great questions from the audience. Again, if you do have any questions for our experts tonight, uh, feel free to leave those in the comments, and I will see them and relay them to our uh, our two wonderful guests tonight. Um, so, why don't we just start off talking about? Um, 
what what's your favorite part about working in banking and and helping people through their finances and either of you can jump on in i'll, I'll jump I'll, in yeah. <laughs> we can keep in the same order <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, so I grew up in, I was born and raised in Greeley, and my uh, family owns a small business. And I lived the challenges and struggles uh, of a family that owns a small business. And as I started my banking career, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of different industries. And I found it fascinating um, how they can make money and do their passion. They're very brave, brave people. <laughs> so um, that is why I decided to take my career trajectory to in, in business banking. Excellent. I'll, I'll be happy to go too. My, I, sure. I was in banking as a branch manager for, for a bank and, and uh, had licenses to do um, some of the financial advising as well, but I wasn't, that wasn't my full-time uh, objective at the time. And I tell this story all the time because it's really what made me turn the page and say, this is what I want to do. And that is that I had a, a client that was about 63 or so and, and uh, was going through a divorce and just really worried about um, what retirement looked like for her, whether she could even do it, was she gonna have to work till she was 75 or who knows. So I had her bring her things and we sat down and we went through a whole plan and, and put it to all together to kind of show her how she could actually retire when she was 65 if she wanted to. And she was literally in tears and it just made my day to make her day and just makes me really love what I do. Um, it, and funny anecdote to this whole story is that I saw her probably about five, six weeks later and she was driving a new car. And I saw her come in, she has a big grin on her face. I said, what are you doing? I thought we had a plan here. And she goes, no, 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 it's different now. I, I work because I want to, not because I have to. And you know that kind of impact that you can have on, on somebody's life to kind of help them be at ease and sleep at night is a huge part of what I do and, and it just makes me love uh, being an advisor. Excellent, Excellent. that's really inspiring. Okay. Um, all right, so it looks like we have our first audience question here, and this is actually a question that I personally uh, also have. Um, and so the question from Mackenzie is, uh, should I pay work to pay off my student loans faster or am I better off chipping away at them? And is there any hope for uh, government forgiveness? Sounds like that's in my my neck of the woods here. Sure. Um, so anytime we talk about debt reduction, we always talk about what impact on the overall budget that's gonna have. And sometimes uh, people have credit card debt that they've incurred as well, which would have a much higher interest rate than a, a bunch of student loan debt. Um, the student loan debt typically tends to be uh, much lower on the interest rate. So that's the first question is, is there other obligations that carry a higher, a higher percent? Um, you're able to write off that interest that you are paying as well. So it's, it's usually not one of the first ones we, we necessarily look at to tackle. Um, but yeah, like any other debt, you want the obligation gone. And so it, it totally depends on your budget and what your total objectives are. As far as the forgiveness goes, um, if we only had a crystal ball, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, I have not heard anything. And we usually get rumblings down through various vendors that we work with. We have consortiums that we, we get together with and kind of share information. And I haven't heard any, any indication that that's uh, coming or on the radar. Um, I know that it, it gets discussed frequently, uh, especially in Washington, but we don't have any indications that, that that is something that we should be looking for in the next few years. Excellent. Thank you for that insight. Um, all right. Well, speaking of, um, you know, just kind of the times we're in and, and uh, how this is affecting people and their financial lives. Um, what are some tips or advice that you would have for people 
currently um, in this in this time that we're all living through right now? Well, we we like to make goals based on long term objectives, and mm -hmm. it's really hard when you're going through something like a pandemic to not pay attention to short term um, things that are happening. But if you keep your eye on the prize, which is some longer term objective with many of what we, the assets we work with, it, it even through 2009 and eight, eight and nine, which was probably the worst that we would ever see in our lifetimes. Um, if you look at it historically, th even throughout just your lifetime, if you run the charts, it's just a blip on the radar. And, but when you're going through it, the uncertainty sinks in and doubt and um, you're seeing that account balance kind of dwindling. And But if it's working towards a long-term goal, the buy and hold strategy almost always wins. Um, good asset allocation, good diversification, and just making sure that you've got protections in place. There's ways to do that where you can where you can create a, a floor for yourself to know that no matter how bad it gets, it can't get worse than this. Um, there's things like that that you can do to give yourself that peace of mind that even when it doesn't look so great in the news and it doesn't look so great in your balance sheet on your 401k, uh, then you can still have an understanding of what to expect long term. My advice for business owners is there are lots of programs out there as bad as it is with COVID. Um, some of the good things that have come out is, is the programs. So um, I would advise, I advise our business members to consistently go out and check um, the SBDC websites. Um, there's also the state of Colorado has an economic um, portion of their website, and they consistently put out different types of funding um, grants. Also, to check with your local chambers, business chambers, as um, they'll consistently put out new grants out there, and again, new funding as well. So get out there, do your research, um, and again, take advantage of everything you can um, to help your business. Yeah, that's really great advice. Thank you. And yeah, that small business uh, development center, that's a really great resource in the community. I know I've attended some of their programs in the past, um, you know, when we could actually all meet in person. Um, and they had some really great uh, things to, to say as well. Um, awesome. So we've got another question here. Um, so Kristen would like to know for sure, shorter term goals like saving for a trip or a car or house versus retirement, how do you recommend people approach short term savings? Sounds like that's in my wheelhouse again. Sure. Um, you know, it kind of depends on what's going on and uh, what your risk tolerance might be. But typically with things that are short term, we're, we're, we're encouraging people to stick with savings accounts and maybe even short term CDs to get just even a little bit more interest. Um, short term is hard right now. Uh, you have the uncertainty of the pandemic. You have this uncertainty of the election. And I could probably throw five or six other um, reasons to be concerned for short term uh, issues. And anytime you have those many uh, that many negative things happening in the in the marketplace it's you want to run from any things that might create risk when you're dealing with short-term investments long term obviously it's a different story uh, but but anything short term i would say just stick with the general savings account savings plan and and go that route excellent yeah sounds like low risk is uh going to be important right now um, well, speaking of uh, buying a house, um, I also have a personal, another, I'm, I'm going to ask a lot of personal questions, <laughs> um, but I might perhaps be in the market for a house uh, in the near future. Um, what do you, what would you guys uh, say is, um, is this a good time to be looking for a house? Is this, uh, should I wait a little bit or what, what kinds of things, what kinds of advice would you have as far as that's concerned? Well, I can speak to this because during this time, um, I just sold my house. Oh, great. Congratulations. And I think, thanks. And I am actually having one built. 
in Northern Colorado. And so um, I was a little bit nervous about thinking about buying another house or building another house during this time. But from what um, I have heard is that the market is really, really hot. <laughs> It, and especially in Northern Colorado. And um, the advice that I received was true. Um, we literally had a an offer on our current home within eight days. And we actually had multi offers and um, got more than asking price. And currently we've, we're, we're staying um, at an apartment while our house is being built and um, everything just is is going right on on target so I in my opinion again I'm not a realtor um, and I'm not a mortgage officer but as a consumer um, I, I felt like it's been a really good time and it was probably more smooth um, so far than it ever has been in the past awesome. e even even with it being a hot um, market and you think home values might be a little too expensive rates for mortgages are historically low so you can get much more home than you could previously for the same monthly payment sorry if i don't move enough my lights go off um, <laughs> apparently i'm mobile. mobile um, but so with the rates being as low as they are uh, you uh, may you never see never these see. again in our in our lifetime and it, it might be the best opportunity to to jump on that just because of the rate interesting well, that's great advice, thank you. And uh, yeah, glad to hear about your positive experience there. That's awesome. Um, so we have another question from our audience, uh, and this is, um, again, something that I'm wondering about as well. But um, this, Brenna would like to know, how should I be financially planning if I'm still early in my career? Um, there's a few charts I need to show you. <laughs> there's, um, uh, the time value of money is a term for uh, basically just allowing yourself the opportunity to have compounding interest. A little right now can produce a whole lot uh, in your retirement years. Um, the, the younger you are, the better off you are, even if it's just a little bit. Um, I know there's other expenses that come with maybe starting a family or purchasing a home and things like that, but um, it, a few dollars now could could replace many 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 dollars when you really try to put stuff away when you're 50. So even when you're young, it, it helps to start because it, it that time value of money is is something you just can't replace. Yeah, excellent. Well, speaking well, of uh, planning for a family, our next question from Adrian. Um, would like to know if I plan on having kids in the next two to three years, what are the top two things I should do financially, such as college funds, savings and accounts, CDs, um, et cetera? So college funds are very popular. They're called 529 plans. Typically there are some other kinds of plans, but they're not as used. Um, so there's a couple of programs here in Colorado College Invest runs them nationwide, and they've got a great plan here in Colorado called Scholar's Choice. And you can invest the money. You can just leave it in savings. They give you several options to pick from. And all of that money that you put in, as, as long as it's used for college expenses when they um, turn the appropriate age, it is going to be tax-free for you. Um, when Even if it grows you know, three times what you put into it, it that would be... Uh, appropriate use of those funds and so you won't have to pay the taxes on those so that that's always the the go-to a lot of people do custodial accounts the only thing to consider there is that once you put money into a custodial account um, that money belongs to that child so even though you're in charge of it until they're of age that it, it's money that is when they're of age they can just take it and go to vegas if they wanted to so that's something <laughs> to consider as well a lot of people will just keep their own savings account and just label it this is for this child or that child and then they'll just set it aside but they still maintain full control over it by doing that way uh, so a couple of different options to choose from yeah yeah it sounds like there's a, a bunch of different options to look at when doing that and that sounds very important as well so um awesome so our next audience question is uh from mckenzie 
And she asks, we did a refinance last November um, and she wants to know, can they refinance again? It depends on who you refinanced with. Um, some will have a prepayment penalty. So you just need to look through that fine print of the mortgage that you did and see if there's a fee to do that. Um, if they don't, then you'd be free to do it again. And I would say act fast. I just read today that uh, as of next month, Fannie and Freddie are both going to Im impose a half a percent penalty for refinances. So um, if you're thinking about it, check on it and do it really fast. And just make sure it's cost effective for you as well. So um, we always say at least a percent. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say, Chris? Yeah, it just kind of depends. Um, you know, most most mortgages are competitive enough these days that the fees to do a mortgage aren't that great. Uh, you 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 run the math on this is how much I'll save per month by doing it, and mm -hmm. and if it costs this much to do it, then it means it takes me it takes me eleven months to pay pay what it costs to refinance. You know, if it takes you three years to re pay off what you're refinancing, maybe it's not the best way to go. And we have some wonderful mortgage officers here that can answer those types of questions at elevations. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Speaking of elevations credit union, um, you guys are a credit union and some people may not be aware of exactly what the differences between a credit union and a traditional bank are. Um, can you guys speak to that a little bit? I can start off if sure. you don't mind, Chris. Um, so basically we are not for profit and member owned. So um, most banks are either owned by, are publicly shared um, or owned by a, a family. Um, and we are actually owned, we say by our members. Um, so when a customer or member walks in here, they are my boss. <laughs> so it's a co-op basically. Um, and at Elevations, we've been here for 65 years. I think we started out with $50. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I'll let Chris speak a little bit more about it. No, you got it. It's, it's <laughs> mem member owned and every, everything is about our, our members. The, from uh, the, the involvement that we provide in the community, which um, far surpasses any kind of bank involvement just because I mean, that, that's what we're all about. Uh, that, that builds further our relationship with you guys at the museum and you, you can name any organization in town and I, I would bet that we have some kind of um, cooperative agreement with them on, on uh, either assistance, aid, or doing benefits like these or anything like that. That's, that's what we're all about. Our profits go um, back to the community mm -hmm. um, and to our members through savings. Excellent. And it sounds like you guys, uh, you have mortgage officers, uh, you, you offer everything that, that a traditional bank offers. Is that correct? Correct. That yeah. is correct. Yes, we awesome. have um, wealth management as Chris, <clears throat> mortgage officers. Um, we also have uh, business banking and commercial banking. Awesome. Um, let's see, looks like we got another audience question here, a question about retirement savings. Um, so if I have an account with a small retirement sum from previous employment, should I wait to roll it into a future account or take the penalty to transfer it into my Roth or another option? And do you have any recommendations on Roth savings overall? That was a long one. Yeah, and very complicated too. <laughs> so you can always roll into a traditional uh, IRA at any time. And then that puts you in control of those assets as opposed to leaving them in an old employer plan that you're, you're not with anymore. Um, so that it gives you more control, gives you ability to invest any way you want instead of the pre-described um, options that are available inside that employer plan. Um, or you mentioned the Roth conversion. Um, that's something that you can do anytime. So even if it's not tax advantageous today, it's something that you could do later. If, once you have it into your traditional IRA, you can do a Roth conversion later as well. Um, what what might be good inside of the Roth? The last part of that question. 
Um, the, you know, that's entirely, that's too big of a question to answer and it's very specific to the individual. Um, you know, a, a Roth, just like anything else is like a 401k, traditional IRA or Roth are just different umbrellas that create a tax shelter over them with different tax rules. And, uh, you know, Roth, you can do anything inside of it. So, you know, do you have short-term goals, long-term goals? Do you need income planning? Do you need, you know, there's so many questions there to answer before I would say, this is what you should do inside your Roth. Excellent, thank you. Um, so uh, just a moment ago, you talked a little bit about being uh, community partners that, as the credit union. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and what, what exactly you guys are doing out in the community, especially in Fort Collins, Northern Colorado? Um, do you guys have any uh, things that you're extra proud of, perhaps? Well, first and foremost, they give us uh, hours, just like you have, you know, paid time off and you've got sick days, but we also have community time that we're allotted and expected to use in, a, in our community. So, um, you know, it'll be on our calendar just at, at my, uh, my community time hours and there's hundreds of organizations that we work with and are available and we go and work in the community every year individually now as an organization um there's a whole lot of involvement there just we we have people that that's all they do at our uh, institution that they just work with within the community to find ways that we can help uh help benefit different um uh, goals or, or aspect aspirations or um, you know individuals so yeah we do quite a bit there we love our not we love the nonprofits in the community um, we partner with a lot of them by helping with events by sponsoring events um, but most of all um, we're there <laughs> um, to help and uh, we're there to support excellent well we've just got a few minutes left and uh, Traditionally, I like to ask our experts, um, what are some what's some advice that you might have if we've got a, a, perhaps a younger person watching the the show tonight, um, if they might want to get into the fields that you guys are in, um, what are some steps that they should take, or you know specific things that they should look into in their schooling, um, anything like that? Want to go, Chris? I can go. Okay, go um, ahead, and I'll I, follow I would, up. <laughs> um, I would um, look into internship programs at um, financial institutions. Um, also, it's a great part-time job <laughs> to um, apply at a financial institution as well. So as a part-time teller um, or possibly even just um, asking if you can shadow. Excellent. I was going to say find a mentor. Um, just ask to come sit down and, and we're, I don't know anybody who wouldn't be happy to just sit down and um, anybody that I work with anyway that wouldn't, wouldn't be willing to sit down and walk through their journey and and maybe give you a few tips on how to skip a few years here or there, paying your dues here or there and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and finding the quickest route to get where you want to be. Excellent. Well, that is awesome advice. And uh, yeah, I think that about wraps up our time together. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you both uh, for being on the program tonight. It was a, a pleasure to speak with both of you and get your insights. And hopefully for those of you watching, you got your questions answered. Um, if we didn't get to your question, there's a slight delay in the, the live stream, but if we didn't get to your question, these videos do stay up on our Facebook page and YouTube page. So feel free to post your question there and we will try to relay those questions um, and type out a reply to you after the fact. Um, so yeah, hopefully you guys all um, enjoyed our time together as well. Yes, thank you, Ben. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Thank you to everybody who joined. Excellent, thank you too. And for everyone watching, don't go away just yet. We have our next two experts coming up. And they're going to be telling us all about the economy or economics. Um, so we have Christopher. Hello, Christopher and Joshua. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Joshua, I don't know if I can hear you. Uh, okay. um, oh, it's just very quiet. Okay, 
Dave. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, awesome. Well, welcome to the program. Uh, as you probably already know, this uh, this program uh, is being live streamed to Facebook and YouTube right now, and hopefully, we'll be getting some questions from the audience watching about the uh, about economics, um, as that is your, uh, of course, your expert field. Um, so yeah, why don't we just start off with some introductions? And uh, Christopher, what do you want to go ahead and start us off and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, who you are, what you do, uh, how you got there, all that kind of fun stuff. Sure. First, uh, thanks again for having me, Ben, and thanks for bringing this on. This seems like a really great event. I currently teach at Emory University at Oxford College, which is a, a subsidiary of the university system in Atlanta, Georgia. I graduated with my PhD from Colorado State University in 2017. And my research focus uh, really hones in on labor market differences across the country. And I also uh, took several classes in environmental economics. So my two fields uh, from Colorado State University program were regional economics and environmental economics. Excellent. Uh, those sound like really interesting research topics and hopefully we'll get to uh, discuss some of that tonight. Um, all right, and Joshua, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Well, I graduated at the, the same year as Chris. Uh, I'm at one of the University of Arkansas, and now I teach at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. My, my research generally focuses on the things that happen when we make decisions that, that are risky or uncertain. Uh, I focus mainly on environmental decisions as well as public policy decisions. Just recently, I've been looking at <clears throat> looking at how um, the decision making of young people differs from older people. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, awesome. Well, I guess uh, let's just start out talking about the economy uh, in general terms. So, you know, it might be, uh, I, I think, at least for myself, it's kind of a vague um, thing that's just kind of out there. But what, what are the really important things to know about the economy? Um, that people may not be fully tuned into? That's a really tough question. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I would like to say is yeah. that the economy is an absolutely massive thing. And, and whenever people talk about uh, how the economy will be destroyed or how the economy is going to surge forward, I, I always wonder what exactly are you talking about? An economy doesn't get destroyed. An economy doesn't move on its own. It's fundamentally made up of people and their decisions and the way they interact. And hmm. I, I really, it boggles my mind when I hear people say the economy is destroyed. Sort of piggybacking off of Josh, I think uh, what people tend to do is associate the word economy with this sort of entity on its own. And what gets lost in that is the fact that the economy is comprised of individuals. And at least for my research interests, um, a lot of times I think that sort of gets conflated with the macro economy and federal government policy and these sort of national scope decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, but in reality, for the most part, I would say it's really local policy and these small individual choices that have more of an effect on our lives, even than maybe those, those federal type policies. And so understanding this, uh, idea that it is huge, but when we start really breaking it down, that's where maybe it gets more interesting. Uh, something yeah. I think we'd want to highlight. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, you know, we're all kind of, well, well, not kind of, we're all living through a very interesting time right now. Um, and uh, what uh, what have you guys seen uh, in the, as far as the effects of the pandemic on the economy? Um, and what kind of analysis uh, can we make or what kind of things can we infer from what, what has already happened and what might happen in the near future? Um, I guess I can start on that, Josh, if that's, sure. that's good. Um, the first thing that I've, I've noticed especially is uh, when you watch news reports and things like that, there is data that comes out that focus on unemployment numbers, things like that, jobs mm -hmm. oftentimes. But what you might miss in all of that coverage is the fact that we still don't really have a sense of what the actual effect has been. 
And that makes it very tough to think about what the effect may be going into the future because data is always delayed. And uh, if you've been charting what's going on with the US Census in 2020, for example, the decision was recently made to cut that short. And uh, that could have long reaching effects for researchers who use that data, such as myself. So um, I think w when it comes to sort of understanding the effects and predicting, uh, we have to be very careful about any type of prediction we might make simply because we don't even really know what's going on now uh, due to lack of data availability. I agree, yeah, yeah that's, that's very good. And I think another thing to keep in mind when we, when we talk about the economy is that different groups of people are affected very, very differently. Um, so the, the white collar working class seeing their, their stock portfolios go crazy. They're, uh, they're afforded the ability to work from home before they have a higher skilled job. And this is wildly different. This is a wildly different experience than people with low skilled jobs are having who don't have a lot of capital to do. And you can't, it's really important to remember that the economy treats everybody differently. Yeah, that's a really good point. Well, speaking of uh, those data points and, and different things that we might be seeing in the news, um, you know, I think we we it seems like there's a lot of volatility in uh, you know the the stock markets and and that kind of thing. What are some what are, what are some things that you guys look at um, specifically to gauge the economy and how its health and how it's doing and, and that kind of thing? What are some some good solid things um, that people can tune into? The first number that I always check um, is through the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I think embedded in that, uh, there are several stories that you can get. And this particular table is A15, for those of you uh, who are interested, released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, and basically, this provides several alternatives to the standard unemployment rate measures that you see. It's called their uh, Alternative Measures of Labor Underutilization, which I happen to have on another monitor here. Um, but the reason the reason that data is really, uh, to me, interesting, and I use it often when I teach students about unemployment in class, is that we tend to take the unemployment rate for granted uh, in the sense of how it's calculated, what goes into it, who's counted as unemployed, for example. And because people may be categorized as unemployed in certain measures while they aren't in others, understanding those differences in measures can be very important, especially when you start using those numbers in something like politics, um, because those numbers can vary very differently. So uh, right now, the unemployment rate officially in the United States is a little over 10 percent, but alternative measures put it at about 17 percent. And that's a very, very sizable difference uh, that affects a lot of people. As Josh says, you know, the economy affects different groups in different ways. But even, even looking just at those, those uh, sort of different terms of how unemployment really comes together, uh, that's one data point I always focus on because that higher rate starts to count people as unemployed if they're working part-time, but they want full-time work. And so a lot of times it's used as an indicator for recessions, because typically the first thing that happens is those workers have their hours cut. And as a result, they see their benefits go down and things like that. And so it's a, a strong sort of predictor of where the economy is headed. The underemployed. And I think also it's important to remember how that data is collected. Look by a certain, they call you up and they ask you, Chris probably got it in front of you, but the question is something like, have you worked one hour for wages in the past six weeks, I think? Four weeks. Thank you. And, and so, you know, if you've worked exactly one hour in the past four weeks for $12, you count as employed. It's really important to remember that the unemployment rate is not entirely related to how people are feeling. That's very interesting. Um, we've got another, uh, well, our first audience question actually for tonight. Um, so, our question comes from Adrian, and he would like to know. Uh, we hear a lot of optimism baked into the job impacts for something like the Green New Deal and its potential to transform many areas of our economy. Are there any comparisons that can be made to past landmark policy changes historically? I would say the closest comparison that I would see is the development of the highway system uh, because it fundamentally changed transportation in the United States. 
Um, and more importantly, uh, part, part of what I studied in graduate school is the sort of ripple effect of policies in particular, because if the government directs money to a region or as a result of a policy spending increases in an area, that affects not only the people who are contracted to do that work, but then they take that money home and spend it, which affects the incomes of other people. And so when, when people talk about the Green New Deal, it, it's often discussed at a federal level where a lot of spending will be thrown in different directions. And uh, the positive of that sort of a policy is that you typically see these ripple effects where a lot of people are impacted, a lot more income is generated. Uh, of course, there might be costs uh, associated with those sorts of programs. Taxes might have to go up and things like that. But um, in terms of something that had a fundamental change to the economy that was relatively similar, I, I tend to think of uh, the 1950s and the development of the highway system. Yeah, and I, I haven't read any, any policy uh, prescriptions about the need, the Green New Deal. But what I read was, was a list of targets that are targets we should try to hit. But not any real methods about how we're going to eat it. Not thing that I would say is it's firm. So it's it's a really hard to compare it um, to, to much of anything. And I don't even really like calling it the Green New Deal, mainly because the original New Deal was money for programs and it was an actual set of policies. I think we've seen that. But from what I can tell about the targets, they're completely in line with what other first world nations are doing. So I don't know if optimism is what I'm hearing, but maybe. Excellent, thank you. Um, all right, we've got another uh, audience question here. Uh, Leslie would like to know, can you recommend a resource, whether it's an online resource or a book or something else, for lay people um, to be introduced to economics? I love, I love the podcasts. Uh, I can, you know, my favorite, Planet Money, a really good one, Freakonomics runs a podcast. If you're more interested in the, in the macro stuff, I like Marketplace. Um, there's a podcast for everything these days. So that, that's a, I, I use them in my lectures. Uh, I have my students listen to them to get introduced to the technology. I think podcasts uh, are a pretty good way as well. I, Josh has always been more into podcasts than I have, but um, I think uh, if you want just free resources, uh, mm -hmm. there there's an initiative out of the community college system in California that provides free textbooks. Uh, it's called OpenStax. Uh, open and then Stacks is spelled with an X um, instead of CK. And they actually put together a fairly decent textbook um, that has a lot of links to data and things like that. So as sort of a reference, I direct people uh, that way, just because it's free, you don't have to spend money necessarily on a book and it, it's peer reviewed and edited. So uh, the information is fairly accurate. On top of that, Excellent. economists write books all the time that are for the general public. Um, and a lot of those things are New York Times bestsellers, so they're not terrible. Keddies was with Captain Kersenry, Awesome Oglu's Why Nations Fail, Freakonomics, the, the first books I read on economics, the New York Times bestseller. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sounds like I've got some uh, reading to do <laughs> and some podcasts to listen to. Um, awesome. Well, I think, uh, was it Josh? I think you mentioned that uh, you deal with environmental economics. Can you tell me a little bit more about what environmental economics means? Generally, um, traditional views of economics think of the economy as, as only people. But uh, environmental economists think of the environment as both an input to production and being affected by the output of production. So we ask about uh, what's the best way to allocate energy, uh, uh, et cetera. And the one thing that, that we often find is that when you think about the effects that the economy has on the environment, or the environment has on the economy, the market doesn't work very well. It's a market failure. Markets don't allocate resources very well. When externalities are present, so when you have when market has an effect on people outside of 
or we were talking about common resources like water or public goods like fireworks. And the, the traditional reliance on markets to allocate resources just doesn't work. Interesting. Um, awesome. Well, we've got another audience question here. Stephanie uh, asks, can you explain what makes up GDP? I hear that term a lot, and I'm not sure what it all encompasses. Um, how does the US GDP compare to the rest of the world? And is this a good measure of overall economic health for a country? Chris, I'm expecting you to quote the tables. <laughs> uh, OK, well, I can. Um... So uh, gross domestic product is an attempt to measure the output of an economy. Uh, it's sort of the simplest way to think about it. And the reason it's often used as a measure of well-being is because um, we tend to think of this link between someone's income and the amount of production that is generated in an economy. So if you produce something or a business produces something, then once it's sold, that becomes income for somebody else. So a lot of times... Uh, as a resource, if you want to sort of better understand it, if you look up a, what's called a circular flow diagram, that's one way to start to think about what gross domestic product is. It's a fairly good visual. And the idea is that if we're trying to chart all of this output, uh, because you're trying to measure it for an entire economy, that gets quite difficult. And so typically gross domestic product is discussed in terms of four components, um, all of which revolve around spending. And basically the idea is that if someone spends money, that means the production has taken place. And so we can basically look at spending patterns to get a sense for what's been produced. Um, you focus on consumers and households. So consumer spending is one component of GDP. Investment, which is really firms investing in machines and buildings and things like that. Government spending counts as part of gross domestic product. And then all of the goods and services that we ship abroad. So our exports minus our imports. And um, there's a lot of criticisms about this as a measure of, of overall well-being, but it is just one measure of many that, that we can use. As long as that link between production and income holds, then it's a fairly decent measure. Yeah, very, awesome. very good. Very good. <laughs> yeah, well, that, uh, that gave me some flashbacks from business college. <laughs> That's the goal, right? I, I remember the uh, the circular flow diagram. I was like, oh my God, I haven't thought about that in years. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Mostly good flashbacks. Yes, yeah. Well, mostly good. Uh, <laughs> so we've got another uh, audience question here from Mackenzie, and she would like to know, are there trends that happen uh, in the economy in election years? Yes, uh, is the very, very short answer. Um, <laughs> But typically, so uh, the studies that I've seen, this is not necessarily my uh, my strength, so I won't say too much about it. But um, the studies that I've seen show that there is a direct link between, for example, unemployment rates and reelectability. Uh, so a lot of times the trends you tend to see in the lead up to elections are policies by the politicians presently in power to try and reduce unemployment rates and boost spending. So that way... Um, the economy looks healthier and they have a stronger chance of being reelected. Uh, but aside from that, that's really the only sort of uh, pattern or trend that I've seen in election years where you tend to see those decreases. Um, and I don't, I don't know much more than that. You certainly are going to see trends, um, but it's sort of a, a question as to whether or not the trend is there or whether or not the economist just wants to see it. Uh, <clears throat> the stock market certainly has trends. I think um, generally approaching elections, there is considerable uncertainty, obviously, in, in the business and consumer world. And uh, people people change the way they make decisions when they struggle to understand what the potential outcomes might be. So I think uh, I've seen increases in savings behavior from both firms and households. Mm -hmm. Josh, why would they save more? I'll follow up question that. <laughs> Um, you know, people people want to have something for a rainy day in case. Honestly, I think some of it is that people are so worried that whoever is elected is going to change everything we've ever seen. So they save like there's a zombie apocalypse. 
the reality is things barely move. Presidents don't have a lot of power. Um, hmm. Legislature moves slowly. Excellent. Well, speaking of saving and investing, do you guys have any um, advice for people looking at, at doing those things? Um, well, actually, specifically investing. Uh, <laughs> do you have any uh, any words to say about that? I would say economists, by and large, are terrible investors. So if you're, <laughs> if you're getting investment advice from an economist and you go back historically, most of them were broke. Um, we're good at understanding the economy, but we're not good at understanding our finances. So I'll, I'll dodge this question. Uh, I think um, one thing I've seen is, is a, a trend towards penny stocks. These are these mm. are stocks that are basically less than five dollars a share, and they get kicked off the New York Stock Exchange. Um, recently, we've seen some app startups like Robinhood and Penny Stock coming up, and uh, people are really losing a lot of money. In general, with finance, your best bet is try not to get into anything that you don't really understand. Penny mm -hmm. stocks are a peculiar thing. I don't understand them. The average teenager doesn't understand them, I, I suspect. Uh, just don't do it. You're going to lose. And, and avoid it. Sounds like pretty solid advice. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, well, Chris, I think you mentioned uh, one of your research interests is wage convergence. And uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and what, what that is. Sure. So um, I guess this branch of literature and research really started in the 80s, but uh, it, it was designed to better understand how wages could be so different in different areas of the country. So hmm. You know, why when you look at any sort of a news article, maybe at the New York Times or something, and they're showing all these average salaries, how can it be so different in California versus Colorado and, and so on? Um, wage convergence theory is the idea that once you account for the price differences in those areas, wages should approximately be the same in what economists would call real terms uh, or accounting for price differences. And uh, this is basically the idea that if I'm living in California and uh, I feel like I'm very underpaid. I am just not making as much of a salary as I could maybe in Colorado or something like that. Then I have a strong incentive to move to Colorado and do the same job, but get paid better in real terms. Right. Um, so, so that literature uh, and part of my research focused on this idea of whether wage convergence actually exists. Um, even though it's great in theory, a lot of cases we don't actually see that. Uh, hmm. So sort of the, update to that after the 80s has really been why exactly don't we see wage convergence even once uh, those price differences are accounted for. Hmm. Interesting. Um, this is a question for both of you. Uh, what is just your absolute favorite thing about economics? What just gets you up out of bed in the morning? <laughs> about the subject or about what I do? Those are two very different things. However you want to answer it. <laughs> uh, well, I love teaching. So, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. the reason I'm working in the university system right now is for that reason, students uh, interacting with them, helping them learn is, is something I love to do. Um, in terms of uh, studying economics, what gets me out of bed in the morning is uh, I found that I just understand things better. Um, you know, a lot of times I felt particularly in high school, uh, or even in college, really, that, you know, I could read a news article and I understood all the words, but I didn't really understand anything. You know, it's, it was uh, the same sort of feeling where you read a whole page in a book and then you don't remember a single thing. Um, so for me, the the thing that, that gets me going and out of bed in the morning is really that I get to understand the world a little better. And now I feel like uh, the more I dive in a little, I guess I understand a little bit more, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's awesome. A little bit more, not sizable pot of coffee. <laughs> yeah, coffee helps. <laughs> really does. I I, um, I like people. Uh, I was an astrophysicist in a different life, and, hmm. uh, and it just wasn't so tough for me. And, and so that that's what sort of that's what gets me going. I I like thinking about people. How can how can I help policy to help? Excellent. 
Um, we have another kind of related audience question from Leslie. If you could change anything about world economics, what would it be? Put economists in charge of it. What was that? I'd put economists in charge of it. <laughs> I'm not, that's, that's a tough question. Um, I think part, part of what I would hope to change would actually start at a smaller level and uh, sort of adapt policy to be more evidence-based, uh, using economists in their research if necessary or other, you know, it doesn't really matter so long as policy works. And I think um, we're still learning a lot about the economy and, and sort of looking back historically, there's been a tendency in economics for one sort of theory to dominate. Mm -hmm. And what we're really seeing in the last several decades, I think, is that one size fits all theories and one size fits all policies don't work. And so the one thing I would change is, uh, even though we're talking on a world scale, sort of take a step back and find a way to to use evidence that we have at our disposal to tailor policy better. Excellent. Awesome. Well, we've got another uh, audience question here from Adrian, uh, who would like to know, are there any industries outside of fossil fuels that stand to lose the most as consumers shift their buying power towards goods and services that mitigate their environmental impact, um, such as Tesla, Beyond Meat, et cetera? If you're looking for losers, U.S. agriculture is going to have some big problems. Hmm. Not, I, I think agriculture is going to be taking a big hit, including uh, meat. And cattle, cattle farmers, pig farmers, etc., is pretty, pretty big. Uh, I think fossil fuels, for they, they do get a, a bad rep, for hmm. obvious reasons. But those companies, some of them are, are trying really hard to turn their image around and invest in greener fuels. I, I think. In terms of what I've seen from industries, um, the big oil seems more responsive to environmental concerns than a whole lot of other industries who are, who are uh, seem to be more interested in, in spending their money on lobbying as opposed to actually addressing concerns. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing I would add to that is I, I've seen quite a few arguments recently that the auto industry stands to lose, uh, just thinking of Tesla as an example. And to Josh's point about fossil fuel companies being fairly responsive, I think we've also seen a fairly strong response on the part of all automakers um, mm -hmm. as they sort of devote more attention than a lot of us even a decade ago would have thought possible to uh, alternative fuel cars or electric and, and so on. So um, I've seen that argument, but I just don't see it given how flexible and adaptable they've been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's hope that's a trend that uh, continues. <clears throat> um, awesome. Well, we've only got a couple of minutes left, and you probably heard me ask the previous uh, experts this question. But um, if there's any young people out there watching uh, the program tonight, I would just uh, really love it if you guys could offer any advice or tips or things that you guys went through um, to get to where you are at. Um, and uh, yeah. So I have to think about this. I, I heard the question and I thought about it, but I didn't come up with a good answer. Um, I think so um, if you're, it depends on what age you are, first of all. So um, first I would say 100% if you are going to a community college, uh, planning on it or going to um, a college or university system or something, take principles of macroeconomics. Um, I, I tend to think of that class as a really good way to understand the arguments you hear in election cycles, uh, to better understand where data comes from, how, how arguments are being made. So um, I think early on, I, I didn't get a sense that it was as valuable as it was. So that, that would be one piece of advice. Um, if that interests you, then if you're thinking about grad school, I think starting early on understanding math is always important. Uh, because what a, a lot of people may not know about economics is that it, behind the scenes, it's very math heavy. So if this is something you want to do, whether you're doing research or teaching, or you want to advise policymakers, 
uh, at some point you'll need a lot of math to do it. So starting that early can always uh, be helpful just so you don't get frustrated and cram it all in. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. And I guess from my own experience, one thing I would add on, which is not necessarily on point, but maybe related, is don't be afraid to switch gears to, to follow your interests. I started graduate school pretty late in life relative to the people. I was, I was Chris's TA for a while. <laughs> I've been I was the best one I ever had. I, as a sort of middle-aged adult, it was really challenging. Um, but it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. And I think that a lot of times people, when they're in school, they find a major they don't enjoy, but they think will make them a lot of money. And I think that that's an uh, antiquated notion uh, that you will make a lot of money as a mediocre engineer as opposed to a real professional. If you're a good dancer, you're going to make more money than that. And you'll kill less people because that is really good. Take, take risks while you're young. Excellent. Well, I think that was some really great advice. Um, thank you for that. And uh, that does bring us to the end of our program for tonight. But I just want to thank both of you for being on and offering your amazing insights um, and great knowledge of the economy and uh, everything. So yeah, thank you guys. Thank you very much for having us. Yeah. You were too kind. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, hope you guys have a good rest of your evening. And perhaps we will see you again in the future. Have a great Absolutely. night. All right. And for everyone out there watching, thank you so much for tuning in for tonight's Discovery Live Ask an Expert. If you do still have lingering questions, these videos do stay up on our channel pages, so our Facebook uh, page and our YouTube page. So if you do still have lingering questions, feel free to leave them on the videos, and we will try to relay those to our experts and get answers back to you as soon as possible. And if you did enjoy tonight's program, please do consider supporting the museum uh, so that we can continue to bring these amazing programs to you. Um, you can do that either by visiting our website at fcmod.org donate, or if you're on Facebook, by clicking the little donate button right down below this video. And be sure to tune in for our other Facebook Live programs tomorrow morning. If you've got a little one in the house, we have a story time at 10.30 a.m. We're going to be reading a book called A Moon of My Own, um, all about the moon. And it's, I think, one of my favorite books in our library of story time books at the museum. Um, and we've got lots of different programs happening. Uh, so be sure to check it out and subscribe and do all the things so that you don't miss anything. Thank you so much for joining me, and we'll see you at the next one. Have a great night, everyone.